You are listening to Love Your Practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I'm a general dentist, a practice owner, and a certified life coach. I teach women who own dental practices to lead with intention and literally fall in love with their businesses. Keep listening and you will see how learning to love your practice turns into loving your life too. Hello, doctors. Lady doctors. Does anybody call you a lady doctor anymore? Remember one time when I was a brand new dentist and I was not young. I was like 33. I pulled this lady's tooth and then she was like, when am I going to see the dentist? (laughs) Isn't it fun to be a woman in our industry? I think it's amazing. Actually, I think you're all kicking ass and taking names to be perfectly honest. Well, welcome to another episode of my podcast. I'm so happy that you're here and um, let's get started. Today, I just interviewed a really amazing woman named Cheryl Schaefer. She's a retired hygienist and she is a myofunctional therapist. It's a really fascinating discussion. We talked so much about how we as dentists can be a part of the team for helping dentists I mean, patients breathe better and stand and have better posture better. And also we just talked about hygienists. We talked about what hygienists want and how we, as their employers, can help them be their best selves, which I thought was a really valuable discussion. So tune in, keep listening. Um, This will be a valuable 40 minutes or so of your time, and I will see you on the other side. Okay. I would like to welcome to our program, The Amazing. Cheryl Schaefer. Cheryl, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, honored to be here and share with you today. Nice. Well, I, I met you um, at the Dental Entrepreneur Women's Conference that we also called Do. And I just thought you were such a delightful person. I needed more of you in my life. Well, it was a blast to be there and get to know so many amazing women in dentistry and just feel the passion and and what's what I love about that group is everybody has different specialties and interests and collectively we um, just make a beautiful picture. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're listening to this podcast and you do something for dentistry and you're a woman, so maybe you have this thing, you know, like Cheryl, what we're going to talk about how she teaches professionals and patients about tongues, right? We're going to be there in just a second. If you have something that you do, and you need a community that you can look into dental entrepreneur women, because they're an amazing group of women. And also we have a lot of fun. Yeah. I like, I like the support and just learning from others. I'm, I'm, um, as we do this um, assessment of our strengths, I number one, I'm a learner. And I was like, Oh good. That explains why I'm a continuous learner and diving deep into the subject. We're going to talk about, I just can never learn enough. And there's always more to learn. Yeah. So I would never have expected to be sitting um, next to you on the couch and have mm-hmm. myself evaluated for whether or not <laughs> I had a tongue tie. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's so funny because um, my husband and I, we race sailboats. And at the end of our, when we travel or at our own club, we sit at dinner parties and and people will often say, so what do you do for work? And if I'm in a goofy mood, I'll say, well, I'm a tongue therapist. And then my husband rolls his eyes and goes, okay, I'll be back in a half an hour. Cause always somebody at the table has sleep apnea or think they might have a tongue tie or have a child with a problem. And the top, the top, there's always the topic goes straight to their concerns. Right. It's funny. Or like, what do you mean? So yeah. Funny. What do you mean by that? First, they always give me a laugh. And then it's like, oh, wait, wait, wait. Like no one's ever helped me with my tongue. There's no doctor of the tongue out there. So Right. Well, there's Cheryl Schaefer. That's where we got to start. Mm-hmm. So like, I mean, how did you even, you can't go to, I'm a, I'm go to tongue therapist school. Right. So walk right. me through your path from how you got to, okay, you're graduating from high school and now you're here. Give me like the five minute version. How did you get to the point where you could show me if I had a tongue tie or not? Okay. All the way back to high school. So in high school, I worked as a dental assistant. Okay. Um, I knew I wanted to be in healthcare. My mother was an office manager of a dental office. And um, so I was exposed to dentistry. I was originally thinking nursing, but decided to become 
the oral health specialist instead of a nurse. And interesting, my daughter ended up becoming a nurse. So she's a nurse practitioner now yeah. in dermatology. So she's like, I had, she was my dental assistant for a little while, but <laughs> Worked as an assistant, fell in love with dentistry, uh, went to dental hygiene school, uh, then got a bachelor's in health education because interestingly, as a dental hygienist, most colleges are two-year schools. However, you go to school for two years for your prereqs before you go to a two-year school. So it's really kind of unsettling to finish four years of college, intensive college, the micros and the bios and all of that, and only have a two-year degree, not to minimize a two-year degree, but after four years, uh, it doesn't sit right. So I went on and got a community health education degree. So I had my bachelor's in community health education, and I wanted to integrate it with dentistry. So I worked in nursing homes, educating nurses on how to take care of um, the mouths because nurses have very, very little education on how to take care of the mouths. And matter of fact, in nursing homes right now, a lot of the patients, they still have their teeth and the nurses in the nursing homes, they ignore the teeth and it makes a big difference for our overall health. And I worked with um, Head Start programs and preschool mm. fluoridation programs. Um, so I really always have integrated dentistry and the community and education. Um, then I became you know, just clinical because I was raising my children and so did clinical dental hygiene for 30 years. Oh. Um, about, about a third of that was in perio. And right. um, moved three times. So I had to take boards three times, which is Ugh. not fun at all. Mm. Um, and love, love, love dentistry. After 30 years, um, as a dental hygienist, your body takes a toll because yeah. it's a very repetitive single task, hold yourself in silly positions, um, movement. And, mm -hmm. um, so at the end of the day, I'd go home with neck and back pain. My arm was tingling and going numb. Um, it, it took a toll on my body and my health uh, to keep up with the schedule and have a repetitive movement business. And um, I loved the patients, I loved the healthcare, but um, I had to find something within the oral health field that I love so much that um, would give my body a break. And I was a burnt out hygienist trying to make it through the day um, seven years ago. I never thought I'd be where I am now because my plan was just to retire and be done. Yeah. Um, but then I found a new path and a new passion. Well, I'm going to stop you for a second because I have a follow-up question before you go to the part where you start the new thing. Mm -hmm. When you say burned out, mm -hmm. I'm just a curious person here. I just want to know, was this mostly physical or was part of it just the difficulties of being a hygienist in the industry? There's a lot to that question. Okay. It, it's a tough schedule, 45 minutes, 45 minutes, or however much time you get, you're, you're just really, really working hard to stay on the schedule yep. um, to meet the needs of the patient, but in a very specific role. So, you know, we do our oral cancer exam, our high blood pressure um, the perio exam, the profi, the follow-up, the health history. There's a lot involved, cleaning the room, setting up the room, staying on the schedule. Um, but there was often even more I wanted to do or think about. So I wanted to expand out of that box. I thought of myself as a box. I was always in the same room with the same task, but you know, if I went into nursing, I could have gone, okay, so I'm going to do pediatrics or I'm going to do um, mm -hmm. hearts or I mean, I, there would, there would be a variety of things I could change and learn and grow and do. So it was repetitive, loved it, love my patients. They became my best friends, especially at the last practice, I was there 15 years. So I would say it's just a tough schedule to stay on. And, um, again, when you're living in chronic pain, it, it makes it even harder. Um, I just really wanted to grow and learn and do more. I feel like Hygienists in general are very curious, want to learn, want to do so much. And um, there's so many things we can offer. Um, one of my concerns is that when I would do certain tasks, it didn't have the value it should have had. 
So for example, oral cancer exams, um, that is really important. We saved lives with oral cancer exams and they should be taken seriously. And now in my um, vision, then my focus that I have now in airway and breathing and tongue function, I feel like we should include sleep screenings, airway, we should be aware of how they're breathing. We should be aware if they have potential sleep apnea, we should be aware if they have potential tongue ties. So, but that time is in our hygiene day. Where do we squeeze that time in? And how much time do we have to get that done? And Whereas, you don't get to take extra time because it's not an insurance billable code. Yeah. It, Unless it, you're in a, a type of office that's okay with that. Yeah, so the, the, the time limit that you have, and um, I even broke it down, what is a hygienist's role and how much time do they have to do each role? And I think it's like, you know, three to four minutes for the oral cancer airway exam. Whereas if you went to your female doctor and you got your female oral can, you know, your, your mammogram or your pap, that's yeah. an important uh, measurable value that you have for that service. And I feel yeah. like in dentistry, we really need to up it and we need to up it for the patient's expectation because part of it is the patient's expectation. So, and I have had patients that were referred to me that said, my dentist said the weirdest thing. They asked how I was sleeping and if I was snoring. And I didn't expect that question from my dentist. It came out of the blue. And mm -hmm. we need to retrain the public that, that we are the oral health professional I don't see dentistry and medicine as separate entities anymore. I see us as dental medicine. So I see us as part of the medical team that specializes in the mouth, which is where essential things happen. Um, so I ask, go ahead. I have to pause you because I have a second question. <laughs> go ahead. Sorry if I, I don't even know if I answered the first one. I'm still over on burnout here. I haven't moved on from that. <laughs> Sorry, I was like, <laughs> my, um, my listeners employ hygienists, mm -hmm. right? I mean, most of them do. Most of them are employers and dental practice owners. And we care about our employees. And we don't want them to burn out. And we value what they do because we don't want to do what they do. We want to do our thing, right? So I've been thinking a lot lately about what hygienists want. What do value. they <laughs> That's what I want to hear from you is, what could a dentist do to help a hygienist not burn out? Feel valued. Okay. Yeah, really, really appreciate mm -hmm. the little things. Really yeah. say, you know what? When you do those oral cancers exams, that has a lot of value. Um, I did high blood pressure screening on a patient and um, he came back two weeks later because I found high blood pressure in him and he was about to go backpacking in the Appalachian Trail. He was a, he was a good friend. And he came back two weeks later with flowers and a card because mm -hmm. instead of going backpacking the Appalachian Trail, he had a triple bypass surgery. And his doctor told him I saved his life by mm -hmm. doing blood pressure that day. And, and I held his hands and I said, please, please go to your physician and tell him. And I wrote his blood pressure down before you go backpacking. Just promise me. And I saved his life. Um, that, that really meant a lot to me that he took the time to bring me flowers and to recognize that what I do is more than just take plaque off people's teeth. If, if I miss a piece of stain, oh, well, you know, it's okay. If I miss a piece of stain behind the tooth, a little mm -hmm. tiny piece, if I spend a few minutes more, um, reviewing their health history and seeing the links between their high blood pressure and other comorbidities they may have. Um, and that's part of my, my thing now is we, um, need to really value what we do and, and how we change lives. And as an employer of hygienists, as I listen to you, what I, what I'm hearing that I could do better is sometimes we, you know, we look at the hygienist production, we look at, you know, how many fluorides did you do or how many PAs did you do or whatever. Yes. And those are important because they're the billable codes and that's what yes. helps make the office run, but also my hygienists are humans with thoughts and feelings and yes. what they need to be fed in their career is real, honest appreciation of the things that they do that don't get recompensed for. Mm -hmm. Is that the right word? Compensated. I'll just change it. And then maybe that's where I feel strongly that in our, and I can't change the system that we need to be um, recognized for other efforts besides fluoride. 
um, yeah. like, the, like things that are life saving measures. And yes, I was um, reprimanded for not doing as many fluorides as new hygienists coming straight out of school, mm. because that if I I didn't um, see that anybody had ever had a cavity and they said, no, I would not like fluoride today as an adult, I wouldn't push it. Yeah. But um, that wasn't my style. So um, I felt measured based on my production, not based on my um, impact. Yeah. And the impact I think is maybe what we as dentists could do better as far as recognizing the non-monetary, but life impacting things that hygienists do for our patients and for the practice. We're an amazingly passionate group Mm -hmm. um, to speak as hygienists in general, because I'm in a lot of just hygiene associations and um, you know, it's just, uh, so there's different groups that are breaking out that are um, healthcare hygienists right now, or hygienists doing different things in healthcare. There's hygienists that are doing, you know, try to move mobile dentistry on for, and there's people that are trying to serve people in the nursing home. So there's yeah. a lot of us that are really trying to branch out be- behind the outside of our clinical box. Your box. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. That was a big diversion that we did, but also I think mm-hmm. super important for my listeners to hear your experience and your advice. So I would just say value and really understand our passion mm-hmm. um, and, and give us more and more things we can do. So as yeah. far as expanding our worth for the practice. Yes. Um, for sure. mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think everybody on the whole team is important. I don't think oh, um, I agree. one role, we can't work independently of each other. I think we have to work collaboratively and really respect each other's roles in the practice. Um, mm-hmm. I feel like the front office task is, wow, that's not one that I would just built for. I couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. And um, they're, the, the, they're the contact person in the beginning and the end of the appointment. And I, they set the tone. And I think they're as valuable as the hygienists are yeah. and the doctors are. We all work, we all work together as a team. And the mission that we have is, is the health and welfare of our patients. Yeah. And when we do that together and when there is cohesive teamwork, it really increases like just the job satisfaction every day of knowing that you're part of a team that's making a difference. Mm -hmm. And I would say um, the other thing to avoid is competition is measuring each employee over the other Mm -hmm. um, based on production. Cause then that yeah. just um, um, can cause conflict in the office. So I experienced that. And to the point where some of the hygienists um, that really wanted their, cause we were bonus based would move the high production patients off my schedule and onto theirs. So oh, that sure. makes, that makes conflict. And um, so you, you just don't want to measure and compare employees, make them a team. Yeah. So I'm just going to throw out this one example and then we'll get back to tongues. I, um, there was a point in my practice where I was wanting to incentivize doing things today, which is good for a dental practice. Like let's do this right now, instead of making an appointment to come back, that decreases the overhead, which is impactful for the whole practice, increases job security. And I wanted to be rewarding my ladies for doing things right now. Mm -hmm. So I suggested a bonus plan where if someone assists or, or arranges for a a same day thing that they would get, you know, I don't know, $5 or whatever. And then my team came back to me and they said, we like this, except for we want to do it collaboratively because anytime we add something um, to today, it's all of us who participate in that, you know, shuffling rooms, taking on each other's duties making it happen. And so now we keep a spreadsheet and we call it the fun pot <laughs> yes. because then what we'll do is they'll choose how we cash in that money. We've done it so that if we're taking a team trip, they can use it for spending money or we've had a party with it, or sometimes they'll cash it out at Christmas time and they'll just use it for buying Christmas presents or whatever. And I think that's a nice example of how we can we can, and we can incentivize exactly the behavior we want without creating a contest or a competition. Right. And, and you talked them. about the fun pot. So everything was put in one pot because you were one team and it was yes. a cohesive sharing plus yes. a cohesive 
entering in and exiting out of that fun pot. So yeah. it, it keeps it a team approach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Really all right. Cool. Well, I suppose we could talk about tongues since that's why we're here. On <laughs> oh, we're all, we're all here to grow together. Yeah. <laughs> but that that's is great. good. For anyone who's listening, if you want the details of the fun pot, um, send me an email. Okay. So you were a burned out hygienist. Mm-hmm. Arm was going numb, breaking, mm-hmm. my body's Absolutely. breaking down. Mm-hmm. And um, so as most of us in this field, we kind of all say the same thing. It's two things. One is there's a lot of articles in the magazines now, in your hygiene magazines, in your dental magazines, there's lots of books coming out. And so a lot of us are reading our hygiene magazine and we see an article about um, myofunctional therapy and the impact of oral function on your health. And then a lot of us, including myself, have family members that you're like, aha, like, wait a minute, my Mm -hmm. child had these problems. And I never realized as an oral health professional, as a dental professional, how I was missing the pieces to pull it together, raising my own child. So and you have a story about one of your sons, right? Yes. So he was mostly grown when you figured it out, but tell us about him. Correct. We had gotten to the resolution, but then I was able to backtrack it and wait. I I didn't realize dental hygienists could specialize in this. I was like, wait a minute. So all those things that we went through with our son, Rick, um, classic. So um, breastfeeding issues, um, snoring, large tonsils, chronic ear infections, grinding his teeth, uh, expansion for undeveloped maxilla, going into a class three bite, braces, braces failed, braces again, had to have his tonsils out, um, ear tubes twice. Uh, but his biggest thing was he couldn't say his own name, which was Rick. If you know my story, you've heard it uh, because he couldn't lift the posterior part of his tongue. And he was in speech for six years. He was in the pullout programs, had an IEP. He was getting bullied. Um, he couldn't introduce himself. And so finally, um, I would kept being told by I wish I had a mom tell me today that, you know, why did you do that to your child? But um I finally said, you know, release that tongue. And two weeks later, he said his name for the first time entering high school in ninth grade. Um, He wrote his college essay on the experience. It was such a significant experience for him um, to be able to give it, be given his voice, to be able to become the person he was supposed to become. Um, So when I read the hygiene article, all the, wow, like, why didn't I know that? I, I didn't know that I could be a vehicle to help others through the same journey I went through. Um, I get calls every day by moms looking for answers um, for their children struggling just like mine did. And uh, so it's become my mission and passion to help these moms, to help these children um, basically breathe better, sleep better, be better. You know, I don't do speech, but I um, do collaborate with speech pathologists to free the tongue, to do the before and after. Um, I don't for the tongue. I refer them to the specialist and we work as a team. I just do the pre and the post um, tongue movement therapy and stretching and wound care um, for those kids. So I have two questions I want you to answer. The first is going to be what gets better when you release a tongue slash mm-hmm. do the therapy? Mm-hmm. And then second of all, this is the burning question that would be in my mind if I were listening to this right now. What is my role in this? How do I fit in as the dentist? Okay. Okay. So what gets better? What's my role? Okay. Okay. So we'll go with what gets better. I I talk by story. So uh, forgive me. And every story is a different story. So just an hour ago, I had twin six-year-olds just leave the house because my office is now on the back of my house and um, they're day eight from their release. And the mom said, oh, oh my gosh, the twins, the boy and a girl. And um, their, her little son always woke up twice a night and ended up every morning in her bed. She said, since the release, he sleeps through the night and he doesn't get up. He had difficulty with speaking between his teeth and lifting his tongue for R. And I said, say some words and said them perfectly. I couldn't mm-hmm. believe it. It was eight days mm-hmm. after. And she said, he speaks clearly. I don't have to keep saying, come back here and look at me and so I can understand you talk. So she can understand him speak clearly. He's sleeping clearly. He's not breathing through his nose. So we're taught that it's just a breastfeeding and speech issue. And um, what I have found by experience working with people, um, it's so much bigger because our fascia is from our tongue to our toes and our tongue impacts our entire body. And so what we do is we compensate. Uh, We compensate with our jaw. We compensate with our shoulders, 
our head to move our tongue, we compensate. And so one of the visuals I give, and, and you can't see me if you're listening in, is if you pretend like your middle finger and your index finger are attached because of the webbing between your finger, and you were asked, you were born like that, to use scissors or a pencil, they would travel together. And then you would have stress and strain down your wrist and your hand be, to try to function without them working independently. So it's that little webbing that is here, if it was webbed to here, it would impact our function and impact compensations. So I see people with TM. I just want to pause you for a sec, because if you're listening to this and you're like, I want to see what she's pointing at, then go to my website, website loveyourpractice.net, and you can find this episode. It should be episode 64, I think. Cheryl Schaefer, I don't know what we're going to call it, something about tongue ties or something. You can find it. And then fast forward through here, we've been talking for 20 minutes or so, and you can watch her do her little finger thingy. It was pretty cool. Okay, keep talking. The impacts are beyond even what I'm surprised about. Um, another super quick example is I had somebody um, in November had his release, talked to him. It was an adult, 26, serious um, sleep apnea, severe sleep apnea, CPAP, trouble breathing, um, overweight. And so after his release, I said, okay, I always ask, what is the biggest wow after your release? And he said, my chest feels more expansive. I feel like I can breathe better. And I just went, wow, just, I hear it over and over again. I would not know it if I didn't witness it. So I just talked to him yesterday and he got COVID and because of his severe sleep apnea and we got him breathing better, his tongue better, breathing through his nose. He ended up in the hospital on a respirator for a week. He's now out and healthy. And my brain thought, wow, you know, if we didn't get him healthier by releasing his tongue from obstructing his airway, because his tongue was falling into his airway from Mm -hmm. the tongue tie, which studies will document, um, and we didn't get him breathing through his nose and get him. He was going to the gym. He was losing weight. My brain says, I just wonder what the end of the story would have been with this, with his severe sleep apnea and the COVID that did put him in the hospital. He got, he got out and he's okay. So it's gigantic. It's so much bigger than we know. Okay. What is the dentist's role? I want to keep it simple because we have enough going on in our practices. So I want to keep it super simple is just look just be aware. I ignored the tongue. It was just something in my way. So it can be two (laughs) steps is have them open as wide as they can and reach their tongue up to the skin on those incisive papilla. So I'm going to demonstrate, but you could just pretend you see me open as wide as you can and reach Mm -hmm. your tongue straight up. Okay. Can you reach your tongue to be on the incisive papilla without closing? Or do you have to close? And I, because I have no restriction, my husband did, my son did, his mother did. Mm. Um, It's my husband's family. So I can reach without compensating. So if you have to compensate and close about 50%, that means that you have to compensate your jaw to be able to reach. Then Mm -hmm. that's step one. Step two is the back of the tongue. So you have lingual palatal suction. So you suction your tongue flat up so you can see that string pop out, caves under the tongue. Mm Mm-hmm. And then see if there's still full opening or sometimes some people all see there are 40 millimeters with full opening, but only 10 millimeters with the, with the tongue flat. on the roof. Yes. So to be able to reach their tongue to the roof, they have to compensate to almost always already be closed. Okay. I have another little guy. He doesn't have his K and his G. Ka-ga. Ka-ga. Cause the back of his tongue cannot touch the roof. So when he speaks, he, he cannot physically make those sounds. Um, but you compensate with your jaw. You compensate with when you're trying to get the food off your teeth, your jaw has to move to sweep the food off of your teeth right. often leads to low tongue posture. Another part of the tongue posture is supposed to rest on the roof. I didn't know that. Right. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be up there all the time. The tongue posture on the roof from infant you know, in utero on helps to develop his house. So the tongue on the roof of the mouth develops the shape of the palate, which is the floor of your airway. So if your tongue is low and you swallow with your lips, Mm -hmm. you do internal pressure rather than Mm -hmm. external pressure. So you make a high narrow palate, potentially muscle wins over bone versus a nice wide palate that later leads to tongue space 
and sleep issues. Okay, you asked how the doctor is involved. Oh, wait, and also if you have that high palate, then that means your airway is shorter and narrower than ideal. And then we can't breathe through our nose, which is very important. And the septum is attached to that. So that could collapse the septum. It's just a domino effect. Okay, so just recognize it. Just lift the tongue mm -hmm. from the anterior, from the posterior, and then ask leading questions. Do you, how do you get the food off your teeth? Does it, have you noticed any speech issues, any neck, it depends on the age. And in adults, I ask TMJ, D, neck and back pain, forward head posture. You know, how does it impact your life? Because it's not just what it looks like. It's also, how is it functionally impacting you? So it's two fold, the sure. structure and the function. And then if it causes behavioral um, compensations and then just have a team. So let's say you're not a specialist in releasing and it, you can know on your team in your area, who in my area specializes in tongue releases, mm -hmm. just have your collaborative team in place. So you can just say, Hey, down the road is my oral surgeon or my dentist that specializes it. Go see them for an evaluation to see if that's part of um, your other comorbidities that you're experiencing. Second question, fifth, sixth, I don't know. Can a myofunctional therapist be the quarterback of that? Or I just Absolutely. go, you would benefit from talking to this amazing person, go see them. You'll breathe better. You'll talk better. You'll chew better. Your posture will be better. And then peace out. And, and so that's, there's two parts to that. Yes, definitely. The myofunctional therapist. So for me, my first appointment is a no charge meet and greet, get them online. Hi, what are your concerns? How can I help you and be a part before we go into the full consultations? Sometimes it'll appear restricted, but it's not. Sometimes with myofunctional therapy exercises and learning how to use the tongue properly, they don't need a release. So, and, and then you, once you figure out what they need, whether it's just therapy or nothing or therapy and release, then you know, the people in the area who like got the good laser or yes, whatever, because lasers, yes. expensive, so I don't they're, know laser. Part, they're part of my team. Okay. So a lot of dentists in the area, they'll refer them to me or the myofunctional therapist in their area and say, I see a functional concern. This is my person that specializes in the function of the tongue and breathing. And then they call me and they're like, I don't understand. But then I'm like, let me explain it to you because yeah. you don't have time to explain it all. I'll say, I'll explain it to you. I'll tell you, you know, let me start with your why. What is, what is your pain point? What, what, how can I make your life better? But I want to make it easy on the dentist. Just say, I have a myofunctional therapist. She specializes in the tongue function, breathing and sleep. Here's her card. That's all you got to do. Here's her yeah. information, yes. contact her. And then she'll walk you down the road because I'm going to assess the function. I'm going to get the function as best possible before they see the release provider. So yes. that, and I do a report. So the release provider wants a report. What is the functional concerns? What, where, why, where, what are we dealing with? What are the range of motion measurements? Mm -hmm. The measurements that you do with the tongue function before they walk in the door, she has, um, she knows she's, I've seen them for a month and um, I have the report on her desk. And so then the dentist refers to me, I do the report. I have the team for the release provider. Then I help them before the release and after the release. So I see them for a month before and a month after minimum, and then help them regain what compensations they had um, to healthy function. Okay, I have one more follow-up. <laughs> That's okay. It's a, it's an interesting path. <laughs> and one I love. Okay. As a hygienist removing calc and plaque, mm -hmm. you needed to function under the direction of a dentist, correct? Correct. And when you work as a myofunctional therapist, can correct. you be your own entity? So I don't work as a hygienist anymore. I haven't worked as a hygienist in over six and a half years. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like if a hygienist decided to become a health coach and got a certified health coach license or decided to go into sales for a, a crest or whoever you want to name, they aren't working under a dentist right. in different roles. So I yeah. don't do any clinical hygiene. I don't right. do Dennis, uh, I'm not a hygienist, um, in my role as a certified oral facial biologist. 
So as a myofunctional therapist, you work independently. I own my own business. It's called facial function. Your business. And you take referrals from whoever knows you that thinks you're smart and amazing. Yeah. I have a great team. Um, Like a meditation. Is there a board that monitors? So so I'm board certified oral facial myologist from the international association of oral facial myology. There's my biggest board. I'm sorry. There's not like a state board that monitors your behavior. Like I have. No, okay. not in, not at this time in my okay. functional therapy. Mm-mm. And that my biggest referrals are probably from orthodontists because they understand that the tongue pushing against the teeth impacts yeah. their um, case and their retention. Yeah. Or the, the outcome. So if they have a, they call it tongue thrust swallow, or t- we call it tongue resting between the teeth, uh, interpro- uh, it'll cause open bite. And the tongue is actually stronger than braces. Um, so the tongue wins. Mm-hmm. Tongue wins. And the orthodontist doesn't want to look bad. So they go to you. And, and sometimes they can't get the bite to close. So a lot of times yeah. they'll have open bite and they can't get it to close. They'll send them to me and then we get the tongue out of the way. So they aren't, they don't, they don't have the force working against the force that they're mm-hmm. trying to um, bring to the teeth to have proper occlusion. Um, I have a lot of cases that are post um, MMA surgery because a lot of times when they needed reconstructive surgery is because the, the function of the muscles was not in balance around the structure. And after their surgical procedures, we want to definitely make sure those tongue, uh, the muscles are supporting the, the surgical, just like a um, um, surgeon of a shoulder or a hip, you know, your um, orthopedic surgeon yep. would be teamed with a physical therapist for the function and rehabilitation of the muscle. They do the structure. We do the function and rehabilitation of proper muscle um, control and balance and harmony. Okay. Last question. I promise. <laughs> this no, has been okay. so fun. I learned it so every time I talk to you, isn't it fun to be it, so smart? I, I, no, it's, it's, it's my, no, you are, it's fine. Just, I just yeah. diving deep into the subject. Cause it, yeah. it's in a huge impact on others. Pretend I'm a dentist who cares about what you're saying, but doesn't know what to do next. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. What do I do right now? I want them, I want my patients to be able to breathe. I want them to be able to chew and swallow. I want them to be able to grow correctly and not end up with a super high palate and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. What's a good, easy next step that doesn't, not a very big speed bump, right? I need easy entrance into where I'm going on this path. Where do I go? Well, the amazing, fantastic thing right now, and that since I started six years ago to now is there's exponential growth in the research that documents this. There's exponential growth in articles, in books, in podcasts. Mm -hmm. Uh, So it's very easy to get your hands on when you search. Uh, As far as tongue ties, Dr. Richard Baxter has the book Tongue Tie and he has courses. Uh, He's fantastic. And he's in Alabama and there's Dr. Zoggy, who is an ear, nose and throat doctor. He is at Breathe Institute. So those doctors are doing research books, uh, go to YouTube. They both put a lot of their lectures. So in the beginning of this, I couldn't afford $2,000 for every single course I wanted to take. So sometimes I just sat around and had their YouTube videos going. Um, Mm -hmm. Dr. Zoggy has a lot of his instructions on understanding tongue ties on YouTube. He's doing a ton of research. He's a ENT out of Stanford now has Breathe Institute. Um, How do you spell Zaghi? Z-A-G-H-I. Oh, that's easy. Okay. Yeah. And, and the so, and then there's Kotlo and there's um, other doctors, but those two are pretty easy to have a lot of YouTube videos on. Mm-hmm. As far as breathing, there's a great book out there right now that is very easy to read. And a lot of your patients are reading it because it's a national bestseller right now. It's called Breathe by mm-hmm. James Nestor. And the reason that book is interesting, and he's on a t- on a podcast. Um, so you can just, if you like podcasts, just listen to that, but he's interesting because he's not a dentist and he's not a doctor. He's a science journalist that went on a journey to understand breathing because he was having problems. So it's an entertaining book and a lot of, um, patients love to read that book that are curious about all the whys. Um, and it's very, very easy read. If you want more dental related, there's gasp, by Michael Gelb. There's six. Gasp. 
gasp, like okay. gasping for air. Yeah. Michael Gelb, Michael Gelb. And he's now doing breathing courses. Um, Airway Health Solutions um, with Ben Moralia. He's doing courses on um, expand, early expansion. So there's just a resource that's amazing. A great easy way to start is other podcasts. So there's the Untethered podcast, um, oh. which has a lot of the big speakers that you can just listen mm-hmm. on the way to work if you love podcasts. And um, there's I Spy with my Myo Eyes, which just talks about a lot about myofunctional therapy. Uh, so many amazing resources, and I'll be glad to send some to you to put on your Thank website. You. Yeah. So, ladies, if you're listening and you are like, "Oh, I need this," then you just go to loveyourpractice.net and go to the podcast section. And like I said, this will be episode like 63 or 64, just in case you're listening to this. Once I have like a hundred, yeah. it could happen. And you're looking and Cheryl Schaefer. So you can look for that. And I just want to thank you so much because your passion just really shines through. Thank you. I'm happy for you that you found something that's so fun and exciting. And I'm happy for us that you are an evangelist for it and that you can help your patients and help us a little bit to understand why it's so important and how we can really make a difference for our patients. Thank you. Yeah. One quick funny thing is uh, the exercises that I give that they have to do to help restore. There's a lady in Japan and she sells pretty much the same exercise. She calls it face yoga. So it's for women to make their faces look better and healthier. And so sometimes I'll tease the women that like it's a cosmetic thing too. So it makes it. Okay. Oh, now I'm really interested. Sign me up. (laughs) Thank you so much for having me. Oh yeah. Thank you so much for being on here. I really appreciate your time. Mm. Love your practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I'm a general dentist, a practice owner, and a certified life coach. Coaching has completely changed my perspective on my practice, in my relationships, and with my successes. I realized that I wasn't out there alone in my thoughts and problems regarding my practice. Sometimes things are happening in my practice and I feel alone and as though something is happening uniquely to me and it is hard and I don't know where to turn to get guidance and support and this group of ladies provides me with that. I enjoy the camaraderie with the other women dentist owners, um, learning from their experiences and things that they do. I would tell any woman who is considering joining the mastermind to stop considering and start choosing their future. It's very nice being with like-minded women that own practices. It really is amazing the way it's it's changed my life as I you know, learn about my brain and how my thoughts create my, create my life, really. Don't consider anymore. Just choose. Choose you. Choose your business. Choose your happiness. Thank you for listening to Love Your Practice with Dr. Laura Mock. I would love to meet you. To join our movement, find the Facebook group called Love Your Practice and request to join. If you can't find it, just send me a message and I'll add you. You'll find me there helping all of my ladies to fall in love with their businesses and have a better life.